Thoughts, banners, and bank accounts. In this episode of The Gray Zone, we'll be discussing the ethical nature of foreign activism. In May of 2018, Ireland held a referendum on abortion, and in the, and a lot of citizens came to to protest this this vote. There was even one group of Americans from Colorado-based nonprofit Let Them Live who came to encourage voters to keep abortion illegal. There was a lot of criticism and support for these foreign activists, and it creates a much larger question of should people who are not citizens of a country be allowed to influence the politics of that country? Hello listeners and fellow conversationalists, this is Brianna and welcome back to The Gray Zone. Today we are joined by Joy Yoon, Dana Smiley, and Julia. Just a quick disclaimer, all of these opinions are our own, these are not necessarily representative of our views, and they are simply, oftentimes are simply meant to provide information, and oftentimes provided for the purpose of expanding our arguments. We would like to start by introducing ourselves and stating our favorite vacation spot. I'll start, my name is Brianna Gua, and my favorite vacation spot is Switzerland. Hi, um- my name is Julia Tabraya. I've never been uh, there, but if I had the opportunity to just go on a vacation for a day, I would love to visit the Swiss Alps. Hi, I'm Joy, and I think the place I'd want to visit most right now is probably Athens, Greece. Hi, my name is Dana, and if I could go anywhere today, I would go to Florence in Italy. We are a group of students from the Lincoln High School Ethics Bowl team working to better the world through dialogue and understanding. Thank you for joining us today. So we should just jump right in, right? Yes. Yeah. All right, let's start with the first question that's as a part of this case. Do you all believe there's a a morally relevant difference between activists traveling to a different country to advocate for a cause and foreign groups funding local causes? So essentially, is there a difference between activists traveling somewhere else to advocate in person or sending funds to do so to a, a city or a location that's not their own? Well, for me, at least, my initial response is to say that being there in person is is rather different than sending in money. I think that, you know, sending in money creates a bit more of a an atmosphere where whoever has the most money is able to influence what happens in other countries. And I don't know, that's like extreme. That's an extremely dangerous road to go down. While sort of standing on the street with a poster is just, you know, there to show your individual support as a person. Just to to ask a question about that, though, what if we think about the costs of airfare or travel, right? Arguably, they're still funding a local... I mean, maybe they're not funding the cause directly, but those who have the means to travel around the world and the people who have access to, say, like, to be able to get a passport, for example, maybe they might pull more weight in terms of foreign protesting than funding alone. Like, is that... A, is the Or do the indirect funds count like a, like a direct donation would? Or do you think that there's a difference there? I mean, I think there definitely is, like, a, a disadvantage that it creates where people who maybe don't have the funds to buy a plane ticket will not be able to go to another country in person. But funding local causes, those causes may have, may pull weight when it comes to, to voting and stuff like that. But when it comes to simply standing on the streets in protest, that that's a much different type of atmosphere that you're creating. And standing on the streets is much less sort of, I, I guess you could say like, it's less directly political and more rather showing your help rather than directly giving money towards causes that may actually influence the politics themselves. Right. I I also think what Juliet said brings up a really good point that foreign activism, whether the funding be direct or indirect, right, like specifically to the cause or for an air ticket, it seems to be really dependent on how much money you have determines how much of an impact you have. And it just made me start to think about, you know, like, in what other ways can you stand up for what you believe and show activism like beyond your own local community, whether that be through social media or, you know, talking online? What do you think about that as a form of foreign activism? I, I don't know. If, yeah, I don't know if I have an answer to that. But going through this case, something that's I've really thought about a lot is posting things online, because arguably, it doesn't cost 
cost money to post things online. I mean, I guess you could say Wi-Fi or if you're posting a lot of information or paying people to post things for you or if you buy bots, that still costs money. But I wonder if that, does that count as activism or does that count as just either trying to get your opinion out there or misdirect other people? I don't really know. I feel like that's such a, for me, that's a gray zone at least. So I don't know if I can offer an answer to that question, but it definitely leads me to believe that activism and what it means ought to be questioned because there's so many different forms it can take. I mean, what what I'm sort of seeing is the is that at least for me when I read this question, I'm sort of noticing that like advocating for a cause is more like spreading the word of the cause, and funding local causes is more like getting directly to the source and being a part of enacting the the newer policies and stuff like that. And so I think that to sort of compare the morality of of these of getting involved in two different stages of foreign activism is I don't know. It just seems like a little bit less it seems like you can't really create a comparison because these are two different stages of activism where one is simply spreading the word of it and the other one is actually creating the policies themselves and for me I think actually creating the policies themselves that's where the problem arises where foreign influence in creating policies in countries can lead to sort of catastrophic effects while simply maybe posting about it on social media obviously getting into the bots that becomes a little bit more complicated but simply posting about something on social media or just spreading Spreading the word of an issue has a much different effect. So I, I agree with you on that. But just to, to provide a, a devil's advocate moment, what what is the point of advocacy if not to enact change, right? What's the point of posting something on social media that you wish people would, would learn more about if it's not to encourage systemic or change, systemic change or change within a local community? Right. I don't I don't understand what the point would be to post about it at all if you're not seeking to create policy change. Now, I, I agree that it's probably not as direct. Right. And you're not tinkering with the, the runnings of a, a local of, of a community based on where you donate to local organizations. But in the end, let's say you have a lot of influence and you're a celebrity and you're posting all of these sources of information. Right. That you're advocating for change. Arguably, wouldn't you end up causing the same amount of change as if you donated to a local activist group immediately because other people would read your posts and perhaps donate to them. I think that's where the difference is, is where other people come in, other people as in people from that country who recognize that, yeah, maybe this is something that I want and then go on and create change rather than you sort of pushing your own influence on individuals in the country without really giving them that much of a say. Like if you are to fund a local cause and they are to create a policy because of all that funding that you gave them, that's that's much different than if you were to say, maybe this should be enacted and then people from that country are are like, yeah, that is a good idea, and then go and help local causes create that policy. But is it is it the local community's responsibility in the first place to look out for those for the other people in their community to enact the best policies possible? Like, arguably, aren't we morally obligated to seek out the proper changes that will create a, a more equitable and a more, I, I guess, a more beneficial society for everyone involved? Right? Are we interfering? in that process by advocating for certain things that wouldn't have happened in the first place? And and I guess if so, does it make it ethical to interfere because the moral obligation is not being fulfilled? Or does that violate that community's opportunity to engage in their moral obligation in the first place and thus makes our act- action unethical? Right. I mean, I think the morals of every community definitely changes from country to country. And so like the case itself says, a lot a lot of times when foreign activists go to these countries, they don't recognize, you know, the, the historical context and cultural context of such policies. And by missing out that sort of information, they they aren't able to fully be they aren't able to be completely informed on what their activism might entail for the people who actually do live in that country. And so ultimately, it should be up to those who really do understand the context of these newer policies or ideas to decide what is best for themselves. That's fair. You know, I think I think this money and activism question that's brought up is really interesting. What Brianna was bringing up about how money can have a greater impact or sometimes influence than being there in person. And I actually feel like one could argue that it's more morally commendable to simply donate money to a local cause and allow local activists to lead the charge and, you know, to really voice their opinions and their experiences and their efforts with this local issue 
rather than traveling to that place and asserting your own perspective and opinion and experiences into that local issue. I think that you could argue that if your funds are being directed in, in an appropriate way, that it could be better for you to simply let other people with the experience stand up and advocate for themselves and, and give them that platform um, with your with your financial resources and support. Uh, I think another thing we have to consider when looking at this question is the idea or value of cultural morality, because, you know, we, we live in the United States where free choice is really prioritized and protected, and we might be attempting to impose that into other aspects of society and nations across the world where they might feel, uh, you know, what is best for their people and for their citizens and, and for their neighbors is to have their, their paths and lives a bit more directed. You know, we see schools where students will take a test in secondary school and have the rest of their careers, their life paths completely directed. And while we might in the United States view that as completely unfair and as controlling of others' lives in that other country, it may be that that is what the people believe leads to the greatest amount of security and, and prosperity and happiness. And so I think that we can recognize a lot of the times that there is a bit of ambiguity as to what makes people the happiest and the safest and the most secure in their country. And yet we still continue trying to impose our version of what is right and what is moral in our country on other countries, which is a huge issue in foreign activism and perhaps why funding local causes rather than being an advocate for that cause with your own opinions and your own life experience uh, could be considered preferable. I read this article earlier about foreign activism, and in it, they talked about considering the power dynamic between countries, right? If you're an, a foreign activist, where are you coming from, right? If you're going to help a developing country, where are your intentions coming from? And pretty much they said that developing countries, when accepting foreign activists, should be wary or focus more on regulating what they're saying when they're not standing in solidarity or in support of your local movements, which is something I thought was interesting to consider. That is super interesting. And I, I mean, it makes a ton of sense, though, too. And like, I feel like this is, can also kind of bring up, you know, issues where there's been activism, but it's not really activism. It's more, I feel like this happens a lot in war, right? Where where we're trying to impose one form of government or one way of life on another country, and it turns into a lot of oppression and a lot of harm and a lot of death of innocent people because we know what's correct. And, and, and sometimes, like when countries don't want that help and we're still there anyways, I feel like that can turn into a huge issue as well. I was just going to say that it's interesting because the flip side of that is when you free, I, I, you could try to free a country from being oppressed, right? And I guess maybe that's where war steps in and not activism. But if we're looking at a case like genocide, for example, you would want somebody to interfere and to protest against that and, and to push back against that from happening. But is that, I guess, th maybe that's not considered activism. Maybe that's foreign intervention or government intervention, but that's kind of a, that's part of the beauty of government intervention when you can step in and save a lot of people. But I kind of, I agree, I agree with you all. The, the line is hard to draw when you're not saving people anymore and when you're just imposing your values on other people. So it's kind of hard to, to find that direct line in the sand. But I do think it's important to consider that there are times where foreign intervention and government intervention is, is needed to, to save lives, right? But I guess in the modern day and age, the majority of the time that it's being used, like if we look at service trips or activism, you know, it's, it's people becoming like volunteer tourists, right? Where they're trying to use an opportunity to see the world. They're not really invested in what they're trying to protest against, or they're not really aiding the community that they're helping, right? They're not setting up sustainable, and I've completely lost my word, it's like sustainable structures. Yeah, like they're not really setting up the, the proper programs that will aid the community that they're helping, right? They're just doing it to, to show that they did act, that they were, they were an activist and that they did volunteer. So, but I, I think that it is important to also look at the, the important bright side of foreign intervention when it can save a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's definitely a time and place for governments to be stepping in. But I think it's also, like you mentioned, the line is really blurry. And, and an example that pops into mind is I, I know a lot of people who will try and advocate for female oppression that happens in predominantly Muslim countries and having um, many 
a lot of contact with Muslim women myself, that's not at all the way that they perceive the way in which they choose to dress, in which they choose to act, um, in which they choose to do. And that's not to say that there isn't, you know, oppression that happens worldwide. But I think it's also interesting to consider where that line gets blurry between saving lives and really imposing on values that are important to people and just on on ways of life that and, and ways of being respected that people hold differently than the way that you might view what's happening. So what Dana said sort of got me thinking um, and sort of to twist the discussion just a little bit. Does a government ever have the right to bar foreign activists or to block foreign ads on social media? I mean, my idea might be slightly controversial, but I would say no. I mean, even after what we've seen with like bots in 2016, I don't think that power structures have a right to limit the free speech of anyone anywhere. I mean, unless that free speech is a threat to cause violence of some sort or is directly contributing to uh, hate speech or something that's immediately threatening the lives and the safety of others. To me, someone wanting to post an ad about an election on social media, I I just don't understand why that can be blocked because then I don't even know where the line would be drawn. And to me, it would be one thing if foreign governments wanted to stop election meddling, right? Like if someone was changing votes or if someone was directly interfering with the machines that count the votes, or, or paying people off to, to write in certain things, I would understand that. But posting things on social media, I just don't, I don't see that as moral to be blocked. Because at the end of the day, the internet is a, a global platform, and anyone, anywhere can post what they choose. So I think the only time that that line can really be drawn is if someone is threatening to cause mass violence to other people, and they're causing fear and paranoia. Yeah, I definitely agree with a lot of that. I guess just a specific example I'm thinking about is China in this instance, how on their end, though, you know, a lot of the citizens there, they don't have access to Snapchat or Google or Instagram because the government is blocking what they see from outside nations. While oftentimes, you know, Chinese propaganda does still get viewed in the United States, right? So does there need to be an an equal exchange or is this one-sided still okay? I think that if we were to create this sort of like, oh, that's not fair type mentality, then we it would result in sort of everybody closing off and not allowing any type of foreign influence into their country. And so I think to enter a type of situation, like you sort of have to have a more open mentality in that you are being welcome to like the freedom of speech and stuff in your country. And you're showing that by, I mean, uh, I don't know. It's it's it sounds awful to say like by allowing Chinese propaganda, but I mean it is a show of the freedom of speech in America that simply isn't present in countries like China and to have them be able to have the power over us where where we are changing our sort of constitution to I guess match theirs. Um that would I don't know, it just doesn't make any sense to do something like that. Yeah, I definitely, I think I agree with what you're saying, Brianna, that it's, that it's a bit interesting um, just to hear how we're answering this question from our lens of living in the United States where free speech is so radically protected, often above all else. And I think it's an interesting idea to consider, you know, there's a lot of speech that can do great harm, even if it doesn't, you know, necessarily directly incite violence. And I feel like we often kind of turn to this extreme of countries in which, you know, there's just propaganda circulated and there's not really access to a free internet or things like that. Then the flip side of that is just kind of this radical free speech. And I wonder if there's a middle ground that can kind of be struck where um, just offensive language, you know, hate speech, I know that that can definitely be between countries as well, not just within a country, if that sort of speech ought to be limited, ought to be, oh yeah, ought to be banned just for the safety and the well-being of, of the people and whether that's something we should consider as well. If sometimes government can and should be, you know, banning certain speech for the safety of their citizens, um, even if it's not a direct call to violence. And it is just about a situation in a different country that is really not at all what the situation in their own country is like. 
I mean, it's tough, right? It comes down to drawing a line, which I think is is really challenging, especially when considering something so subjective as just words, right? I mean, we use them every day, but they carry a lot of weight. And I think it's it's hard to kind of establish where you stand on what should be allowed and, and what should be what should be discouraged or perhaps even banned for the safety of others. I mean, that's, that's a big question to answer. I'm not sure, but I, I do think something to consider too is as soon as you log on to the internet, I mean, like as soon as you connect to the Wi-Fi anywhere, Everything you see, you really almost have to take with a grain of salt just because, and I'm not excusing language, I'm just saying if someone was posting fraudulent information online, for example, right, or propaganda of some kind, there's there's so much potential for people to deceive and to trick on the internet just because there's no face-to-face contact and you can post anything that I think that there really has to be a movement towards engaging with the web with a more critical eye. And I just think that's something to add to this conversation in general. You know, and, I, and that's kind of aside from the issue of free speech. But like the fact of the matter is, is that there is stuff out there, right? There is propaganda out there. It's just in general, it's out there. And so it's important to, to just examine everything with a critical eye to begin with. And I think that's a, a piece of education that needs to occur more frequently as well. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I think it's something we should, you know, keep in mind for the rest of this conversation. I guess just to tie it back a little bit to specifically foreign activism and what we consider to be ethical about it. Do you think it's fair to say that the most ethical form of activism, you know, is independent of the government, right? So it's initiated by the individuals. I feel like government involvement and, you know, their interest, we, we wouldn't consider that international activism, right? Foreign activism should be... No, it's interesting, though. Yeah. That's like, that's, a, that's interesting to distinguish between, but... At least for me, I feel like there's a clear distinction between what the government is doing, between the, like, you know, the government officials themselves and what the people of the nations are doing, you know? Yeah. I don't want to take it too extreme, but I think if... If the government is the one who is taking their activism to another country, that sort of seems like propaganda or something like that to me. I mean, it it just seems a little bit more infiltrative than advocative. I mean, for example, there's a part of the U.S. government called the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor that like a line of it says protecting human rights around the world is a central part of U.S. foreign policy, right? And the government getting involved in another nation under that clause? I don't know if it's a clause, but is that foreign activism or is that something different? Is that politics? Or is it diplomacy? Right. I don't know. For me, at least, like right now, the purest form of foreign activism among citizens is independent of government involvement. I'd say free of religious and like corporate interests. Any ideology or idea that could be of an ulterior motive than to just helping the people and being altruistic about it. I just thought of religion, like money and the government. If you have anything else to add to that. You wouldn't, what you wouldn't consider that activism if it's attached to any of those three things? Is that what you're saying? Or the most ethical form of it. Okay. I don't know. I, I struggle with that. I, because I don't want to, I don't want to write off all corporations as self-interested, and I also don't want to rely- write off all religious groups as self-interested either. I'm not saying it's like purely out of self-interest, but I think if it's related to a religious interest, you run the risk of having some of your, you know, your own ideologies imposed on others without even realizing it, right? I understand that. I I do think though that there's, like for example, there's a big problem just within the city of Portland, right? of, and this is not foreign activism, it's just thinking about activism, with the government not wanting the churches to get involved with setting up programs with them to help the homelessness population, for the homeless population, for example. And although some might say that the church, I know it's the church versus state issue and that the church shouldn't get involved, there is a lot of good that the, that those programs can do that I, I think that it's 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 quite harmful to to not allow them to to exercise the, the influence they have with the community in order to aid people. I don't know because I, but I, and I do think that I I'm kind of conflating activism and setting up programs in other countries, but I do see them as the same thing because it's just that motion of getting involved and trying to set up different systems elsewhere. Like I see that as a form of activism. I think that if a church wanted to go to another country and help set up something 
something that would really aid a community there. To me, it's hard to to say that that's not an ethical form of activism. Maybe if they were trying to convert people or if they were trying to force their views, I could see that being problematic. But if they merely wanted to use their funds as that organization to go set something up somewhere else, I don't know if I can necessarily say that that's less ethical than someone who spends their money to go get on a plane, to fly, to stand with a sign in the street. You know what I'm saying? No, yeah, I definitely get what you're saying. I guess just to rephrase what I said earlier then, I'm not saying it's unethical, but when religion or, you know, like corporations are involved, just to tread a little bit more carefully as to where your interests are coming from. Sure. Yeah. There's also not a lot, this is sort of unrelated, but there's also not a lot of like information on the effectiveness of foreign activism. Like, I mean, it could be extremely effective and maybe it's not that effective. Like, it's just, like, not very known. But do you think that could maybe affect the morality of foreign activism? Like, say, say in a specific country, the influence of foreign activists is, or it's a, there's a lot of influence from foreign activists rather than from locals. Do you think that makes it more or less moral or, like... Is the morality of foreign activism reliant on its effectiveness in countries? Or, or like, ought it be reliant on its effectiveness? I think it's hard to say, you know, a lot of times, especially if you're speaking up for human rights, as an individual, you might not have as much influence as if the whole government were to get involved. But I think the intention, you know, the intention to want the best for humankind, and that should be acknowledged and seen as moral. I mean, I'm just I'm just thinking of a situation where, like, maybe the individuals of a country want one thing but like the people the people who are foreign activists come and want something else and and like they just might so happen to be like the majority in that specific situation and so what the foreign one ends up being not what the people of the country themselves want and yeah and so while the foreign activists may think that they're doing what's best it might not oh i see what you're saying yeah i think this this is really interesting to me and we touched on it a little bit at the beginning of this conversation but it's a part of the advocacy that we have to consider is whether the activists are standing like in favor of what the people of the country are want or like against is that what you're saying yeah yeah i personally if i were in my own country advocating for change and we're finally reaching a majority and then some foreign activists come and <laughs> completely opposing what our citizens want i think that'd be a little problematic Well, and it's interesting, too, because when people see foreign activists interfering in a way to expand the liberties of people in another community, they're typically praised, even if that's against what the community wishes to do, right? Because people somehow come up with the idea that they're freeing those people, when in reality, that may not be the case with what the people actually wanted. But then when a group of activists tries to limit the individual liberties of a community, then they, they're somehow scorned. You know, like it's... It's interesting how the whether someone is getting getting more liberty or less liberty influences our, our decisions. And and I still thinking about our idea of I guess I don't know if cultural relativism is the right way to say that, but how the values and the systems within a, a community kind of shape what they wish to see. And so when people assume that they know what's best, it's kind of this paternalistic figure that is inappropriate in the grand scheme of things, especially if they end up harming the change that was being done initially that the group of people wanted to see. Yeah, there's just so much to think about. Like, <laughs> Should we take a look at another one of these questions? Does it matter if the activists flying into Ireland before the referendum are of Irish descent, or if they are Americans who have lived in Ireland for many years prior to the referendum? I mean, I think this is one of the questions that's more difficult to respond to. Does everyone have an equal right to get involved into, in the matters of another country? Do you have to have some personal connection to get involved with it? I think, I think it definitely comes at an extent. Like, you can't say, my friend is Irish, and therefore I have a right in all Irish politics. But I don't know, like, if, if you 
are of Irish descent or if you like lived there for a long time, I think you have enough understanding of the culture and possibly of the history to be able to make an informed decision on what's best for the population. I mean, I'd be careful with like just a just a generalization like that because I do still feel like at the end of the day the people who are in that country right now and who are living that experience right now are going to have the greatest knowledge about what's best for them. Although I do agree that maybe it's a bit of a sliding scale where if you are of Irish descent or you've lived in Ireland for several years, you possess greater knowledge than the average foreign activist who doesn't have any connection to Ireland. But I definitely would still maintain that the people of the country are the ones who are going to be directly impacted by the the referendum that might go into place and thus have the greatest stake in this issue here. Yeah, that 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 also gets me thinking of like if we're to take that idea and put it just into the US where it's like a lot of people who are of Native American descent but like many many times removed and yet still believe that they have a say in what happens to the Native Americans of our country and like that how that's extremely problematic. That sort of makes me This situation makes me think of that case where it no longer makes sense. Like you can say, yes, I am of this descent, but you are so removed from the culture that that it doesn't even make sense for you to be able to have a say in the, the happenings of the people anymore. I mean, for me, it really comes down to who is who will experience the effects of the change. Right. Who's who's actually going to be impacted by the issue? Is it you're trying to influence or not? I mean, because it's to me, it seems immoral to go somewhere and maybe accidentally harm other people just because you wanted to see your wishes carried out. You know, just because you feel a connection to a certain place doesn't mean that you necessarily know what's right. Right. It's almost if you have stake in the game. Right. If you are going to be directly impacted, then you almost you have a right to be involved. And I mean, arguably, everyone has a right to do that. If, but if, if they end up violating the liberty of other people in their search to, to make a difference, it seems unethical to me. You know, it's it doesn't seem quite right to be able to influence the lives of other people without feeling the impact of that yourself. Although I guess, how can you really tell whether someone feels an impact, right? If they make great change in the world and let's say they advocate for voting rights and people in another country receive more freedom to vote in their upcoming election, maybe the person who advocated is deeply affected by that. I don't know. It just seems that if you're not going to be living in that community and feeling the effects of what you've caused, it seems wrong to either assume that you know what's best or to attempt to create that in the world. I I definitely agree with what you're saying. But then if we come back to advocates for human rights in other nations, what if there really is a genocide occurring and, you know, you can act or you cannot act. You won't necessarily feel the effects, but just, you know, it's something immoral is happening there and you feel an obligation to want to help. In those cases, is it okay to act even though you're not at personal stake? Yeah, I would almost say that this is kind of what I was thinking about earlier too, but if your activism expands the liberty of other people to choose for a certain situation, then to me it would seem moral as opposed to you imposing new rules or laws onto other people that would then make their lives occur in a different manner. Right, I'm trying to think of an example that kind of grounds my issue. I don't know, I think voting is a really good one, right? Like, let's say you want to call for a referendum of a leader that is uh, internationally recognized to be a dictator of some kind. Okay, if your activism to allow that country to vote if that's if you're working towards allowing people to have a choice and some autonomy in their lives, I see that as ethical. But then let's say you've you saying you say no, I want to uphold the current system as it is. They shouldn't have a choice. They should keep it the way it's always been. And then you go and you can fly off and go live at home while they live under a dictator. You know, that's that's a problem. So it's almost like if you're going to ultimately allow people more liberty in their lives, then perhaps it's ethical. But if you're going to place new demands on people's lives or perhaps cause them further harm by saying that they should or shouldn't do things a certain way, then maybe it's unethical. But I guess my opinion is kind of political, too, in giving people a lot of liberty as opposed to creating systems that would place a more, not restrictive, but a more focused construction of law around one's life. So I don't know if if that influences what I see as immoral or immoral in this case. 
Yeah, when you say that, I mean, I definitely agree with you, but, you know, I'm thinking of this case in the sense that we, the people who are discussing this case, live in a country where where liberty is something that is sort of put on a pedestal and, and one of, like, the most important things in, in our lives. And in another country, they may see, you know, their values to be something quite different. And because of that, their attitude towards the values of liberty and such might be different. And so when foreign activists with though with their personal values come in, that's where the, the conflict arises. Sure. I agree. I mean, I think I completely agree. I think it's very risky to, to try to, to get involved in foreign activism, unless you can clearly tell that people need lives, people's lives need to be saved, just because I think there is a cultural clash there. I mean, that's why I acknowledge it too. I think by political ideas and, and just my opinions is possibly influence what I see to be moral or immoral in this case. But I think it's, yeah, it is interesting to, to think about how the cultural values of country can influence what the, the changes or lack thereof of changes they would like to see in their society. And I agree that that's definitely something to, to think about. Yeah, and I think that's what makes it all the more difficult to come to a to a ground con- a conclusion on foreign activism because like every case is just so different. And when it comes to the morality of foreign activism, I think it it really is a case by case type of question rather than a umbrella solution. Yes. Yeah, so I I mean not to kind of take us back into this conversation that seems to not have a clear answer. Okay, so Julia, you were saying that like and that foreign activism is really tricky to advocate for unless it's like saving people's lives. But I guess that there's a huge sort of gray zone and this idea of of what quality of life is and what it means to be fulfilled and to be happy and to have opportunities and to be safe and secure in your country. And that obviously extends far beyond whether you were alive or not, which I think just kind of contributes to this issue um, and kind of contributes to this idea that Brianna mentioned about foreign activism being such a case by case basis, because while it might be easier to just say, you know, we should only get involved if it's a matter of life or death. I do want to acknowledge that there's a lot of uh, sort of in between area between being alive and being dead, that contributes to people's well-being and to just the fulfillment that they can derive out of life. All right. right. That was it for this week's Gray Zone. Thank you for listening. If anyone has any comments or questions, please email us at thegrayzonepodcasts at gmail.com and we will respond in our next segment. If you are interested in having these discussions more regularly, we invite you to have ethical discussions in your daily life. These cases are from the National High School Ethics Bowl, so please get involved. Thank you for listening, and we will see you next time on The Gray Zone.